Uh, I'm, for those who don't know, I'm Dick Cantley. I'm the treasurer here at EUC, and I chair the Campus Development and Prioritization Committee, which has been working for about a year and a half, or maybe a little bit more, taking in, get, gathering input from BUC's uh, programs and uh, departments and interest groups. Additionally, we've gotten congregate input from our uh, advisors on the capital campaign, CCS, during their due diligence. Uh, many of you folks got asked a lot of questions. And beyond that, additional research has been done, uh, some of which you'll see in, in a couple of minutes, by Inform Studio, uh, which is our architect, which was chosen from a group of six architect candidates uh, with the help of Keith Brown and Frank Arvan and John Hammer and Steve Lorry. We're now well along in the dialogue between BUC uh, and uh, INFORM. We still have ways to go in that process. I don't think dialogue's ever done in Unitarianism, but at any rate. <laughs> I'm going to ask something of you as you view INFORM's presentation, and that is don't get too hung up on the interior details, where the partition walls are, where the copy machine is going to be, how the office is configured. Those things are going to be addressed uh, as we continue this dialogue, um, and uh, we'll have a real active back and forth with INFORM coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we presented INFORM with four major challenges as they tried to form architectural solutions uh, to our urgent and essential needs that we've been talking about. One, uh, probably first and foremost, is to make us a more welcoming campus. Uh, secondly, to help us be more accessible. Our accessibility is not great here. Uh, to help better serve our programs, things like RE and music, and do it in a way that helps us be greener than we are today. Uh, Inform is focused on two major areas of remediation, which is what you'll see in a minute. And because some of our urgent and essential needs fall outside those uh, areas of remediation, things like the parking lot that they're not going to be uh, concerning themselves with, uh, or refurbishing or remodeling the chairs that you're sitting on today, those kinds of things. Uh, we, we kept Inform on a pretty tight budget to carve out dollars for these other areas that need remediation in the church that they'll not be talking about today. Um, I'm going to be happy to field questions at the end of the presentation, but we're going to give Inform a little bit of a pass and make them just be presenters today uh, because I don't want to put them on the spot regarding issues that we need to resolve internally. So I'm going to ask you to stay up at a, at, at a conceptual level uh, and, uh, and uh, not get uh, too involved in the details. And uh, they've got some very, very exciting concepts for us. So with that, I'm excited to introduce Michael Guthrie and Lindsay Cooper of Inform Studio. Thanks, Rick. Nothing like setting the expectations high. Um, I'm, I'm going I'm to maybe go against uh, something that Jim asked me to do. Can, can everybody hear me back there? Raise your hands if you can hear me, not... No! no. All right, we'll use the mic. It's tough holding two things, but client wins. So, um... Yeah, and you know what? That's a really good point because I wanted to do the same thing. There are some seats up here. Feel free to come in and sit down. Don't be shy about it um, as, as I kind of get started here. Um, just to be able to say, you know, hello and good morning. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, we are really honored to be a part of this process. Um, I think in, in first being able to visit the church here, the facility um, was just something very special about it and told us that um, it was a congregation and an entity that uh, had a love for design and had a love for architecture, um, and that it was very much a part. Uh, you could feel the facility was very much a part of what was here, and that was just really exciting for us, and I think something that, that I hope that you'll see that we took very seriously um, and that we felt was really important. And so, um, I know Dick said we'll be quick, it'll only be two, two and a half hours, and we will not be out to but... Um, it, we, we've got about 35 slides or so, and we, we wanted to give enough. It should be about 25 or, or 30 minutes. 
Um, but just to give you a sense of where we went along the way and how we arrived there, and maybe a little bit of you know next steps, and, and, and in just small order sort of bringing that. So uh, without further ado, kind of getting started here. Um, as Dick mentioned, there was a lot of criteria that was given to us to start to evaluate. Um, and so there were really two things, and we look at this, there's project priorities and RFP objectives. So we were given an RFP and a project list. When we looked at that, essentially what you see is all the areas that were colored, looking at the upper plan and then the lower plan, those are all the areas that wanted some level of touch or something done. So it's a lot, it's pretty much everything in the whole, in the whole church. Um, what we tried to do is decipher down and we went through a research process to say what are all of each individual particular ask, request, or need. So I won't bore you with all of those, but just to give you some ideas, the sort of yellow here addresses pieces of, of accessibility, then we had issues of storage and where those were located, and all of that kind of amounted, if you looked at all of those individual components, what we did is we graphically represented those together so that we could see where areas that became darker and more colored, where was there was a lot of overlap and a lot of emphasis that would be required. And that allowed us to be able to evaluate where are the areas that are the most, where can we touch and get the most out of those areas. The other thing we evaluated is all of the different groups that were involved. And it was amazing. I mean, this church is, is highly utilized. You guys are touching the community in a way that, that we've honestly not really seen. Um, and to, to kind of get your arms around that was a, was a challenge. I don't think we're still there, um, but certainly a, an appreciation for it. Um, the other thing we did, maybe everybody had an opportunity to participate in this, but just to get a sense of how people moved through the facility and utilized space. And so this is uh, kind of the conglomeration of everything, but we broke it down into all different pieces and just kind of researched and looked at it. So it was to say that we went through a really concentrated research process, actually the final or the initial presentation uh, that we did to uh, the campus initiative committee was about 94 slides of, of research and information. And so that was to be able to say, when, when we come here, what do we do? And uh, just to, to be at the very highest level, what we decided is that to have this idea of, of areas of consolidated intensity. And there's sort of a front zone here and a rear zone here where we felt if we did um, some major renovations to those two areas, we could accomplish a lot um, that would happen all the way across the church and then look at dappling in other things in other areas. So what I want to focus on is those two areas of concentrated in intensity or consolidated intensity. The first one here is up by uh, what's uh, religious, educa religious education, classrooms, those types of areas. And so looking at it as existing, one of the key pieces was looking at accessibility. Um, right now, there's two really separate buildings. Everybody knows it as sort of green door, red door, blue door in terms of access to those. Um, but there's a sort of sense that you always have to go outside to get to them. And then there's a topographical or um, height change that you have to go through either through stairs or ramps or things like that. So we felt like that was a tremendous need that needed to be looked at. The other was there was a sense of the way storage was gathered and storage was very particular to certain locations and the bathrooms as well. In other words, if, if you had a, a full house sort of in Blue Door, well there was only one bathroom available because you'd have to leave the building to go to another. So how can we start to look at consolidation of storage, increase in, in storage, and look at the accessibility and access to restrooms. And so a simple solution um, that, that we felt could happen here is really to eliminate all the, the pieces in between. And so it takes out the restrooms and the storage areas, still staying within the existing building, but it allows for a continual access all the way in the interior. So um, a simple ramp piece that would be here and a ramp piece that would be here within the interior would allow you to access all of the different spaces and they could be broken up in any different arrangement that would be required without having to go outside and without having to tra traverse stairs at all. The second component that we looked at was then uh, the addition of storage and bathrooms. But in doing that, we wanted to continue to think about that accessibility and how important it was. And so within that, it's centrally located, so that the distance that you would traverse from this space or this space, everything centrally located, two barrier-free uh, bathrooms or larger bathrooms to allow accessibility to be used by anybody in those bathrooms, and then a centrally located uh, storage area. As we start to look away, the pieces come together, uh, knowing that we're sort of filling out this corner, it was also important to understand that relationship, and we'll talk a lot about this, 
the connection from exterior to interior, that you never lose that kind of connection to the exterior, how the, the natural areas connect to the building. And so what we looked at is there's a glazed piece here, and a glaze could be door area that's access uh, continued to the Memorial Garden in Glen. Um, and so that you have a continual view through this, so you never get the sense that sort of I'm contained within something. Anywhere I'm going, I always have uh, daylight and view to the exterior. When we look at, uh, at the overall numbers, and, and this was sort of critical for us, when we evaluated the storage, we evaluated the storage also in the music room storage downstairs. And so those totals were, there was essentially 569 uh, square feet of storage if we looked at all of the existing that was here and the music room downstairs. In a new storage space, we would have 1,761 square feet. So what it would do is it would actually triple the amount of storage and allow it to be in a place that's sort of centrally located and accessible. And it can be broken up into a lot of different ways. And I think that alludes to what Dick was talking about, that, hey, there's details that will work out what it's used for, how it's used for. Right now, what we want to understand is that, hey, there's a huge increase in storage, and it's in a place that we can have it centrally located and used. So who's using it and how it's used, that's going to be detailed down the road. But uh, right now, we felt confident that, hey, there's going to be a substantial increase in storage and accessibility to that storage. Um, this was interesting. So how do we start to define what the form or the morphology of the building would be in its relationship? And one of the things that we felt very strongly about when we came um, is just the sort of beauty and inherent materials that are here. Uh, a lot of them are very natural, particularly on the exterior with the brick and with copper. Um, looking at what Yamasaki had done and what Osler had done and connecting uh, exterior space to interior space. And so what we saw is there was a lot of exterior brick in the interior spaces here. There was the idea of connecting the copper into the interior spaces here. But the other thing that we saw, thought that was very beautiful uh, about the church was all of the white, which really reflected the idea of light within the interior. And we felt like, hey, this was a really good opportunity to not only blur the edge where the exterior comes into the interior, but how do we take the interior and project it to the exterior? So that you're really blurring that line and that language between inside out and a lot more. And so what we thought for, really for the uh, storage building, was a very quiet um, and, a, and a very um, strong just gesture that would cap the corner. So it sits a little bit higher, uh, but the idea was it would be it would be white, it would be masonry, or a little bit off-white, maybe with some texture in it. We're not totally sure what that material would be, but it would be masonry so that it complements uh, what the existing material is, but also that white so that it really connects you know, the reflectivity, bringing in light. Um, the other aspect that we saw was an opportunity where, where right in the interior, if you look at these arrows, they kind of project to where things are. So. Uh, this aerial arrow is showing the north elevation, which is here. This arrow kind of turns the corner, which would be the east elevation. And then there's a section that shows right through here. So you'd be looking back at the blue door building, and that's what you're seeing. So this would be the courtyard. Then the idea is that the connector in between has glass on both sides so that you're allowing uh, light and view to come in both sides. Um, but then really to connect maybe another idea of a glazed brick or a blue, a kind of shimmery be in the area where the, where the bathrooms essentially are, but just to give a little bit of, of peace um, and, and intimacy, and because there's a, a place for color um, sort of throughout, being red, green, and blue, it just influence a little bit of that and take that idea of the color where it just kind of peeks out uh, on the exterior so that you get a little bit of, of just a, a quiet area uh, that's there. Um, and so then looking at, at the front area, you know, how do we start to respond to that? And this really started uh, with circulation. That was a, a really big, and we felt, requirement all throughout. We'll talk about how it connects together. But in particular, there was a lot of discussion about the stairs that were here. But when we, when we started to look at how things are accessed now, and this really came out in the kind of models, the circulation models that we did, that within this zone, it was almost a corridor in terms of the entrance because of the way that the columns were, were sort of set. So you have this sort of sense that everybody moved through, and then in the, in the seating areas and where the kind of conference glass table is, um, name, name tags and things like that are done, the circulation sort of happens within it. So there's a lot of mix of these types of things. Um, the seating arrangements were such that this was a little bit more of an office lobby uh, arrangement. This had a little bit more of a, of a living room arrangement. Um, and then, you know, some seating that was here. So we looked to say, how do we sort of create spaces 
and then really allow circulation uh, to occur. The other component is where you come in. A lot of people are coming in in this direction, so that sort of lack of sort of central main entrance. How do you sort of look at your sequence of arrival? And right now, the sequence of arrival is sort of moving into to the pocket here. But for those who are coming for the first time, that may be a little bit harder to find. And so what we wanted to do was keep the things that were really strong about this, the connection to the exterior, feeling like there was a, a threshold that you went through, a real you know, intimacy that occurred, but at the same time, give a little bit uh, more prominence to it and a little bit more uh, exposure to it and allow the circulation to get a little bit stronger. The other piece of it was, again, looking at, at uh, storage, but the storage here was really more coats. And so understanding where coats were placed, how they were placed, potential for increased amount of, of coat area, and then the bathroom, um, looking at a little bit more in terms of public restrooms and facilities that, that people can utilize. And so it sounds like kind of boring program, but what we felt like there was a real opportunity to do something with that. And so really the sequence was to open up a lot of this space. What you see here is the, is a, is the idea that this would be more of a ramp or sloped floor. Um, and I want to make the, the distinction between a ramp and a sloped floor. A ramp is kind of handrails and a little bit steeper. This is a sloped floor which wouldn't require from code-wise having any railings or handrails or anything like that. It would be more as though you were walking um, San Francisco is a little bit steep, but imagine a little bit of a hilly, you know, kind of space that you're walking along. And so it just has a very subtle slope to it. And so what that allows, I think we need a little bit of additional distance, but instead of making a, a small skinny ramp that you move through, it's actually a sloped floor and a space that you move through. Um, so now the gallery is really a space that, that you can move through. And what it allows us to do with, with the ramp or the sloping floor is to congregate different types of seating arrangements around it. So now the circulation is very fluid where it would move through, there's sort of a connection that you come to the entrance and then coming into the commons, which has a really sort of special place as we understand it programmatically for the youth. Um, and that's the sort of nature of a very intimate sort of entry within that. Um, and then really critically important, we felt, was this idea of reception. And so when you come in, there's kind of a lobby space that's here. There's a connection to reception and to information so that when you come in, there's a welcome sequence that occurs. And that happens within this space. And then within this space, there's the ability to get coats and sort of tuck in behind here and coats and tuck in behind here, but really opening up this whole space and we'll see uh, what that means in terms of views and connection uh, to the exterior as we go forward. Uh, the other piece is to really sort of comfortably tuck the restrooms in behind similar screen wall to what's now, but get a little bit more space to it and a little bit more room for circulation to move in and, in and around that area. So when we look at this overall, uh, the existing code storage was about 34 lineal feet. We would now be going to 44 lineal feet, so it's about a 25% increase in code storage. Again, it's sort of tucking it away, and we'll talk about what that means to this piece so that it doesn't necessarily block the entrance, but it becomes a, about um, kind of a very interesting interplay of how you experience entrance. Um, and then looking at two restrooms, so doubling the capacity of the public restrooms uh, that would be available uh, in, the, in the entry. Um, the other component is, is starting to look at how the office works. And what I want to really uh, address within this is to be able to say that this isn't necessarily the final configuration of the office. It's to say, here's a set of relationships that occur, and we'll work out the office in, in detail a little bit later. And the relationship is such that originally, if you look at it, the reception is sort of in a deep area within the church here. The office functions here, and then there's a small conference space in RE. And so you're having to move through circulation zones, and so that connectivity from one to another is sparse and far away in a smaller space. So what we look to do is sort of connect that in a much closer space so that reception happens right adjacent to the office and there may be an increase in, in connectivity that happens there, also into our e-office and conference. Now some of these things can swell and get larger, get this way or that way, whether it's bigger conference room, larger RE office, other office space. So those are all things we can move. It's more about, hey, understanding the relationships from one to another. And then that brings us back to sort of this idea of seating um, and, and really, I'm going to start here with this connectivity to information, and the idea would be, and, and you'll see a little bit in this, that information can now happen through, through some digital means, so that you have things that uh, are on an information wall, um, where it can be rotating displays that are always current, 
Uh, every time somebody right, taps up the posters on the board, right, and then three minutes later, you know, the same posters on the board and people don't pay attention to them as much. This allows a rotating display of information that could be directly connected to what you have on your website. And I, what I was noticing is, man, there are a lot of events going on here in, in December. And, uh, you know, just an amazing way to be able to say just the way people would move through a website, a lot of that material can be there. Uh, there's an opportunity for touch screen display and some other things. We're really able to look at this as an information zone. And that information zone could spill into this. And so what we see is there's an opportunity for sort of flexible seating but communication, whether there's temporary booths that are set up or things for events that are happening or other types of conditions. But this can really be a flexible type of space that can have seating that can be arranged in a lot of different types of configurations and make it easy to use. But it also creates a kind of energy that I think that you'll see as people come and people enter uh, the facility, there's a real strong connectivity. And what we see within this is if the Marshall Courtyard is here, and you look in the key plane, you have the sort of the pavilion and the seating here in the Marshall Courtyard. What it allows is the Marshall Courtyard to now be that mediator between two congregating spaces. So whether it's other adults or young adults or um, you know, people that you want to socialize all together as a congregation, but at the same time, I think we all recognize that there's some demographic things where you know maybe the youth doesn't want to totally socialize with uh, you know their their older counterparts, and maybe a little bit vice versa. I mean, I run into that sometimes, and so it gives different pockets and spaces for people to be, but yet all be within the same space connected to the idea of the exterior and the martial courtyard. Um, and then the seating areas are different, you know, informal seating, more uh, couches and things, but maybe less living room and more uh, of a lounge type of quality. And so when we look at that, uh, this is essentially the sort of reflection of what that would be. Um, and it's really to be able to, to look at the sort of notion of when you come and you enter into this space, um, the removal of the sort of masonry wall that's here allows you now this sort of clear view all the way through. So this is the, the sort of nature of the sloping floor that you see. It brings you down uh, about two feet. So if I'm standing in this space and somebody's sort of seated within it, I can actually see right over the top of them and outside into the Marshall Courtyard. So there's a lot of connectivity to, to nature that exists there. Any time in any space that you're in, you're always able to see sort of, you know, down an avenue in any direction of circulation back out to the exterior. So there's a constant connectivity no matter where you go within the space. You have a connection to the exterior and really it helps for wayfinding because you know where you are within the campus being able to see uh, out to the exterior. Um, a little bit of the idea of, of some of the seating arrangements and how it can be informal and then also where it is just a very loose congregating space for standing. Um, any of you have ever been, and, and I'm sure this happens in the pavilion and maybe even coming in here today, right? You get a group of people who are standing together and you're trying to meander through. It's just that space to allow people to move through and be a great congregating uh, location. So being very flexible. Also looking at this idea of information where I can get things both digitally and there's an ability to get things personally. So there's both opportunities to get that and then where that can sort of extend into this zone as well. Um, again, the sort of notion of, of really staying clean with the materials that are already here. And we felt that that was uh, important. So uh, the connectivity to the white, looking at the natural materials, uh, addition of sort of wood and this sort of flexible bench and seating area, and then uh, exposing the existing brick that's, that's there as well. Um, another piece that we really wanted to connect to, and we talked a lot about sustainability initiatives and what that means. And I really want to emphasize that maybe right now, we're not talking about uh, the mechanical systems or the photovoltaics or, or geothermal and those are all things that can be important pieces that get integrated but I want you uh, to, to really convey how important it is that you do things in the upfront design side that can then affect those systems later in other words if I have a building that performs stronger in terms of energy in terms of daylighting the amount of energy that I will need to operate that facility will be less, meaning that the pressure on those systems will be less. I won't need as large of a system, I won't need as much heating and cooling if I think about how the building is designed initially. And so um, here's just a sort of quick illustration of that. If, if you look at how we're breaking this up, this is the, the northern glass or the, that's at the Marshall Courtyard now. It brings in a lot of natural light, there's not a lot of uh, artificial lighting that's needed all throughout the day. And so the idea is to bring that sort of same sequence in. So there's a clear story like here and there's a clear story like here so that we're constantly bringing in north light. So if you look at this, it, the, the roofing structure sort of drops down 
but the space can be naturally daylit all the time. And so there would be essentially um, uh, photo cells that would be distributed or light sensors that would be distributed so that there wouldn't need to be lights on at any time until the evening and then you would have um, essentially uh, automatic controls that would operate. So it, it lowers the required loading of daylighting which also will uh, or artificial lighting which also lowers the requirement of heating and cooling uh, in those spaces. On the south side and you'll see here we still really wanted to open that up and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but we've uh, demonstrated sort of shading devices that you'll see within that that's very focused on how it brings in both the quality of light and deals with uh, issues of solar heat gain. Um, the second component of that is to start to look at what we call climatic mediation. And that's to say that we zone different areas within the facility in terms of their temperature control differently. And so what you see is these are more active type of spaces, circulation type of spaces, as opposed to more sedentary resting spaces. So what we can do is design those, you know, for instance, in the red areas, if it was summertime, uh, we would cool those to perhaps 75 degrees or 40% relative humidity. humidity. In the other spaces, it can be 80 degrees and 50% relative to humidity. Now that may sound hot, but the thing is, is when you walk in and it was 95 degrees and 90% humidity outside, when you hit that 80, kind of, a, oh, that's a comfortable transition. As opposed to, I don't know how many of you go, uh, you know, to the, to the mall or any place else and you walk and say, oh my God, freezing. You know, and uh, my wife brings jackets to movie theaters, so it's kind of crazy um, in the summertime. Um, but what that allows is a kind of thermal transition. It's actually not only an energy saver, but it's better for your body, just in the way that it responds to things. Um, so it's very much about being in touch with, uh, with not only energy savings, but how your body connects to uh, different spaces. Um, and also looking at the overall, so this gives you that accessibility in terms of a big picture. And so now really the sense is, and we know that people will still come in the social hall and kind of come in some of the side doors, but really sort of affecting how do we take this whole piece as an entrance, looking at this as almost a funneling effect that brings people in and then allowing people from those spaces to connect to everything within the sanctuary without having to go, or not the sanctuary, within the facility, without having to go outside and without having to go downstairs. So everything is totally accessible uh, with, within the interior. Um, the last piece that I just wanted to focus on is to give you a little bit of sense of how we were framing this whole front area. Um, and, and the way that we saw it and, and the way that we, we felt about it um, is a very kind of special connection. And to be able to say that you can really break it down to the commons building, there's an office building, and a social hall building. And we left sort of a remnant of this idea of the brick wall that was there so that there's kind of a tracing of where things have been. We felt that um, in the past with the, with the Yamasaki edition then, or the Yamasaki project and then where Osler came in and some of the other editions that there's been a really strong connection to preserve the quality of what those are and at the same time anything new that comes in is responsive but unique to its own so that it doesn't try to imitate or be something else. It allows those things to have the strength and power that they are in and of themselves. So the question is, how do we deal with this as an intervention? Um, and so what we looked at it is, you know what, there's so much of this is like this is exterior space. How do we actually make this exterior space again? And so uh, the first piece that we looked at is essentially to be able to say, okay, for the office building, and we look at putting office functions together, let's connect an immediacy to that, right? So this is all one function that's together. Um, conference space that's here, the addition is such that, you know what, we want to allow this to still be visual all the way through, so that you can see all the way through this thing. And if not a visual transparency, at least uh, so that light can filter all the way through, so that you have the sort of sense of connection that's there. So there's sort of an edge condition and an edge condition, and that makes an interesting pocket for that idea of, of the common space that you go into while still allowing light to filter through this. Within this space, it's simple. We manipulate everything at the ground. And so what we're taking is, a, is essentially sort of an integrated seating piece and then just allowing that floor to slope down, give you a little bit of that sunken seating area. But that's it. That's all that happens within uh, this area. Outside of that, what we do is we say, how do we maintain it? We look at glazing. And we look at glazing in a way that's environmentally responsible. So again, coming back to all of that northern light, eliminating the amount of solar heat gain that's in, that's going to really control the quality of the light that, that's within it. 
Uh, but as we drop it into place, again, everything is connected to the exterior. And the last piece, um, this is kind of a, a, an interesting and a sort of special you know, piece for us. Um, calling it the cloak and the veil. And really, uh, because of what those, and, and think of those more as verbs than nouns. Um, somebody mentioned the cloak and dagger. What's that? What's going on? So, um, but no, if you think about what a cloak and a veil does, what we looked at is one piece that is almost works architecturally like origami. And so what it does is it goes between these conditions of cloaking and veiling. And the idea of cloaking is that the coat room, it, it creates a little bit more of, a, of an enclosure around that. Uh, for the restroom, it sort of forms into something that is screening. And then the roofscape, it provides shelter, right? So you have the sort of sense of how it cloaks this area, still allows it to be exterior, but how it manipulates and changes to those things. The other component is this idea of veil that you'll see, and that's a perforated scrim. And what that means is there's, there's two conditions of the way that this works as it drops into this space. So when we look at the veil, the veil is looked at in two ways. It's more of an experiential quality, but it's also a performative quality. And the performative quality is such that if we look at this as a perforated screen over the glazing, what it allows it to do is that it, when the sun is high, it shades all of the glazing from the sun. So that essentially you're getting the daylight that spills in, but you're not getting the solar heat gain. At the same time, you're able to see through it at varying degrees, and, and we'll look a little bit at that in this next image. Um, in the uh, wintertime, when it's cooler and the sun is lower, some of that sunlight's gonna be able to come through and hit that surface, but in a very dappled way, so it's a controlled way. Um, if you go to any spaces that have a lot of glazing that faces the south, even in the wintertime, it can get very hot. So this will be a very controlled environment. We'll work through that in energy models to figure out exactly what that dappling will be. Um, but I think, you know, and, and we say that all to say, hey, we are going to be green and we're going to deal with these things. But there's also something just experientially of what that means. And the idea of the veil is such that where this is all open, the veil is something that's very special, I think, you know, spiritually. If you think about it in the way that it connects things to even marriage. Um, and, and I think about... You know, when I see my wife on, on our wedding day, and you come and you kind of have that veil, and it doesn't reveal everything all at once. You get kind of a picture to it, and it's inviting, and it's interesting, and you look at what it is, and then when the veil opens up, you kind of see everything in its, in its full glory. And that's the manifestation of what this is, is to really be able to say, you know what, you can see into this a little bit. But there's a little bit of a control of the veil, and then it opens up to a very large entry space that's inviting uh, that essentially brings you into the to the facility of the church. And so uh, the sequencing is such that there's subtle perforations that all happen within this veil. You'll be able to see through, particularly more in the evening and, and when you have those spaces, but as it's backlit and you have a kind of duality of being able to see both from the exterior into the interior. But there's moments where it'll become a little bit more solid or embossed to conceal things like the cloakroom, uh, or the coat room, I should say. And then over the top, it still allows the light to be able to spill in uh, to those spaces and really opening up to a large prominent entrance to invite people uh, to come in. As we, um, you know, this is coming back to, to Dick, and, and, and I understand very clearly he's the treasurer. And um, <laughs> so, we, you know, we're, we, we get pretty excited about architecture, you know, and you kind of go in these directions, it's like, we've well, got a budget, and I'm like, okay, thank you for reminding us. And, and, uh, and, and we understand, uh, I think it's one of those things that, that we know that we're not dealing with the parking and there's going to be some collaboration with some landscaping and some other pieces that come in. But I think what, uh, what we want to do is see that really integrate. So it's not as though in the next step we see it as totally separate. We see that as a very integrated process. But what we had to do is encapsulate, okay, here's what we're dealing with right now. And so we wanted to be responsible uh, with that money. And so the number that we came to was essentially 1.17 million, I think of the, uh, 1.6. thank you, 1.6. I didn't want to misspeak that overall number. Um, so it's a portion of, right? This isn't in, in everything. Um, but this is how we felt like it, it could potentially work. So we talked about those two areas of consolidated intensity. Uh, the first one being to the north is really broken into two zones. One, which is kind of the initial circulation, the other which is an addition. And there'd be two different ranges of numbers that we would work at to achieve that. The second, and really this is the big one, 
um, is within this area, which is accessibility in the front entrance and storage and, and office. Um, and that gives us a, a number that's just under a million. The other component that we look at is, you know what? We still have, between these sort of light brown areas, uh, 5,082 square feet that we'd like to do some refurbishing. We're talking like carpet and paint and those types of things within those areas to just really bring them to, to uh, a fresh state. Uh, and that gets us to about $16 a square foot. It's manageable, it's possible. We're gonna encourage those of you who, you know, hey, if you purchase paint and then you come out for paint day, that money is gonna go a lot further. So, um, you know, I'm doing my best here to try to, you know, work, work up the enthusiasm about it. But uh, what that will put us at is about 1.174212. Uh, and, and that's kind of the number that we're looking to hit. Um, we're excited. Uh, about this. I hope you are as well. Um, we, we're looking forward to continue to work with, with Dick and his group and, and thank you so much for having us and uh, we look forward to moving on from here. Thanks so much.